Hello, and welcome to the Race to Speak Up podcast. I'm your host, Devin Moore. Today's guest is Steve Sarowitz. Steve is the founder and chairman of Paylocity, a leading U.S. provider of payroll and HR solutions. He is an international philanthropist with an interest in promoting unity and universal education and advocating for the elimination of racism, sexism, nationalism, and religious prejudice. Steve is a passionate Baha'i who has given presentations about the Baha'i faith and its vision of world unity at several universities, the parliament of the world religions, and other venues around the world. Thank you for joining us, Steve. How are you doing? I'm great. Always happy to see you. Always happy to see you. Yeah, it's always good to see you too. We haven't really spoken in a while, actually. <laughs> That's why I'm happy to do the podcast. Awesome. So, see, we met through Humanity Rising, and you are honestly the first person to really teach me about the Baha'i faith. So why don't you start us off with telling us about like what the Baha'i faith is and how you like your journey with it and how you're spreading that education and awareness and understanding of unity. The Baha'i faith is the latest chapter of God's eternal faith. Uh, God has sent messengers throughout time, uh, Moses and Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad. And we have followers of all those wonderful messengers. Uh, God, the Baha'i faith believes in the truth of all the messengers of God. And that each one of them came with a message to love God and to love thy neighbor. And in each age, God sends a, a messenger, each of these messengers, with social laws and uh social laws and teachings that are perfect for that age. So in this age, as you mentioned, Baha'u'llah has talked about unity and the elimination of prejudice. So I um, first heard about the Baha'i faith when I was about, how old are you now? You're 18? Yeah, I'm 18. So I was about a year or two older than you. I was about 20 years old, I think, when I first heard about the Baha'i faith. I was in college and someone did a presentation on progressive revelation, which is really what I'm talking about, that a single God has progressively revealed the truth to humanity. And it made a lot of sense to me. I didn't pursue it actively for about 25 years. And then by that time I was running with a very good friend of mine every three days a week. And he asked me to go to a Baha'i study group. And I ended up going with him and his wife. And within a few years, I was a Baha'i. I decided that I wanted to become a Baha'i. And what the faith has done for me has really allowed me to crystallize um, how I view the world, and really been a guide for me. You, you mentioned eliminating racism and sexism and nationalism and religious prejudice. These are all teachings in the Baha'i faith to eliminate all prejudice. And so it really focuses me on these areas. And it guides me also even on how to eliminate racism. You know, I think a lot of people want to eliminate racism. In fact, if you talk to people, there's very few people who would admit to being racist. In fact, everyone you know, certain people call other people racist. Well, this is racist and that is racist. And I might agree with some people and less with others, but the whole point is it's very hard to find someone who actually admits to being a racist. And I think it's very important to know how to eliminate racism, not just I want to eliminate it, but what are the specific things we need to do? How do we need to approach it? And the faith has been very, very helpful in that, in that to that end. It's kind of... Um... I'll say interesting that you brought up that there are like large majority of people who will not be likely to admit that they are racist when they in fact are probably racist. Cause I can really just relate that to bullying in a sense, you know, with the bully, they will not be so quick to say that they are hurting someone or say that they are inflicting pain. I see racism as a form of bullying because it is, it's a form of tormenting other people and targeting them repeatedly for a specific um, reason, for something that's specifically a part of them. Like I've gone through racism just as a black youth in, in, in this world, a black person in this world. And so I, I know how much of an important issue it is. That's why I'm very happy that you're even, you know, really working to spread unity through Baha'i faith and through your beliefs and, you know, just, uh, like things like that. So when you were younger, you went through bullying though, right? I did. I was raised Jewish and I was beaten up. I went in fourth grade. I, well, I was bullied a little bit. I was kind of a shy kid, a skinny kid. I'm, and you know, I'm quite large now, uh, mainly tall and skinny, but not, you know, I'm not the type of person most people would bully because I am pretty big. Um, but when I was younger, I was a skinny kid 
And, you know, tall and skinny, but, you know, not particularly, I'm still not particularly strong, but I'm, I'm bigger now. And um, I would get bullied for various things because I was shy and, and quiet. But one particular incident stands out. I was in, I was playing with a friend. I'd been friends with him for a couple of years. And there was about half a dozen kids. And all of a sudden, my friend throws me down on the ground and starts beating me up. And I knew to stay down. I didn't know why. I've always had a very, very good sense of intuition, even, ba even back then. And I stayed down and let him beat me up. Even though I was about his size, I could have definitely held my own. I could have definitely gotten up and at least run. I was faster than him. I was actually a very fast kid. Um, but there were six kids around. And I thought, well, no, it's better for me to take my beating. A couple of them were a couple years older. And it, it just, I felt like everyone knew what was happening. What was really odd is I didn't even know why he'd done this. And as I was getting up, someone said the word Jew, and I knew. And, th and, and then I got up and I, and I went home. And I, I didn't tell my dad uh, really ever because my dad was a boxer and my dad would have gone. My dad was much bigger than his father and my dad was very powerful. And he, he would have beaten the heck out of his father uh, for, for that um, because it came from his father. But uh, I, I was very angry for a long time. And, one thing I, I understand to some extent, you know, just from that experience is why black people are, not all black people, but many black people are slow to trust white people. And why when I'm interacting with black people, I have to be a little patient with the understanding that they have to get to know me. And, and I found that once my black friends have gotten to know me, it's, there's no problem, but I have to be a little patient. I have to earn their trust. And because, you know, They've been hurt, and I and I know this for myself that I was very angry, and, and there were many years where I would have, if I had seen this person and he'd said almost one word to me, I would have snapped and put him in the hospital, and and I was strong enough to do it. Um, luckily, I didn't. I never ran into him again. I never talked to him again. But I had that anger inside me, and so, you know, I know that um, there's people, black people are painted as violent and you know angry, and I'm thinking to myself. Well, you know, having been in that situation, knowing how I reacted to just being beaten up once, I had other things I had a swastika put on my locker. I don't, I think that I actually admire black people for their restraint and for their patience. On uh, that, That's just honestly a true statement. And I don't know, I was in another situation years later in a board meeting where uh, because I was white, people didn't believe me. And uh, it was very frustrating to me. Uh, it was I was the only white person in the room, and I was I was advocating uh, for something uh, which which wasn't popular, but I thought was correct. Eventually, the board did agree with me, but I, I I kind of felt like what it was like to have to not be believed because of the color of my skin, and it wasn't very pleasant. And I was very angry, and then I took a couple of days to digest it and said, "Oh my God, that's how just about everyone else in that room feels every day." And uh, there were a couple people on my side, but most of the people were against me initially. And then eventually they all came over because they realized I was right. Well, thank you for sharing that. I also look back at how things are taught, you know, in older generations, hate is passed down from generation to generation, that mindset, and then they inflict that hate onto others. And so, and then like also going back to what you said, you know, when you're in a, a racial minority, your, your voice isn't always the first to get heard. I have unfortunately gone through that before. That's why I know it's, that's one of the reasons why I know it's so important to speak up. Another, and then like how I always tell everyone is just the fact that, or especially you, the fact that your voice matters. You know, what you say, what you say is important. You need to speak up when you're going through something, when you're going through anything, to be honest. In fact, you really should just be like, speaking up a lot because you're still developing, you're still growing, you're still a young person. For you to go through those experiences with getting beaten and, and having a swastika and like all these other different experiences, I know you. it has taught you a lot. You are very much a knowledgeable and educational um, man. I've learned a lot from you, but it's just so, it's so crazy to hear that. It's so, it's irking. It's definitely enraging. Well, one thing that I've learned is to forgive people. So I, I've forgiven my friend, my former friend. I, I haven't talked to him in 50, well, almost 50 years. Um, it's been about over 45 years. Um, I've forgiven him for what he did. And I realized that he was the kid who just had poison put in him. You know, we as human beings are supposed to love each other in every holy moment. 
not just limited to the Baha'i writings, but in every holy book, we're taught to love each other without any exception. And so someone like him who was taught, unfortunately, uh, to hate, you know, in, in such an awful way at such a young age, that just makes me sad, actually. It doesn't make me angry. I feel sad for him. And I, ironically, my sister is actually friends with his younger brother. So, and my sister's Jewish. So, you know, hopefully, you know, so there's some hope and maybe there's hope for him. I just hope for him that he's no longer, because hate is a terrible thing to have in your heart. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's also kind of interesting that you bring up too. Um, but forgiving, forgiveness really does go a long way. I've just noticed just in my personal experience dealing with racism or bullying, just with hearing from other people, other change makers like you that change me, I mean, excuse me, that forgiveness can go a long way and just, and you personally just growing, you know, you've gone through your own things and now you're literally the founder of Paylocity. You're someone who spreads the um, unity awareness through the Baha'i faith. You have a, quite a few things to, that are going on, to be honest. You, you have a lot well, of different things. Well, we're making movies and I just, our company just uh, completed a movie called Racist Trees, which is about how trees were used to separate and until very recently in Palm Springs. It, you can see there's this beautiful golf course on one side and then there's this really thick trees. And on the other side is this neighborhood that you don't see from the golf course. And it's a black neighborhood and you know, blacks couldn't live in you know, Palm Springs was segregated like other people. And Palm Springs is known as this liberal Mecca. I guess there's a lot of LGBT people here there and who are white though. It's, it's a very interesting because there's this dividing line between white and black LGBT. You know, frankly, there shouldn't be dividing lines between anybody gay or you're straight or you're black or you're white or you're Jewish or Christian or Baha'i. You know, you've heard me say this many times, we're one human family. But then there's permutations of prejudice. And so Palm Springs, I think, um, I won't tell you about the movie, just you can go see the movie for itself. But in the end, I believe they did the right thing is all I'll say, and which is good. But I think that sometimes there's hidden prejudice. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've had prejudice against my own family, as, as you know, I'm the only white one in my family. My, my wife is a person of color. My kids are people of color. And one of my children just ex experienced a lot of prejudice after moving into a new house. And uh, we suspect that racism might be at play. And you know, my black friends have told me <laughs> that, oh yeah, it's racism. There's at least some element there. And this is in a very liberal town, uh, which again, supposedly isn't racist, but one of the comments which was publicly made against us was, well, we want diversity, but not this kind of diversity. Wow. <laughs> Very so, interesting that you bring that up. I've heard that before too. That's the only reason why I'm like, wow. Um, and I, I think what that person meant to say was, well, we don't want college students here. Uh, but, you know, my, my daughter's a lovely person. I, I don't think that's an accurate statement, you know, or any statement negative about her is accurate. She's just, you know, she's a, a beautiful and wonderful person. But I, I think that, you know, when you listen to that statement, it just sounds terrible. And I think there is an element of racism. In it. You know, like, what does it matter what color they are? And, and who are you to tell, tell us we're not the right kind of diversity for the neighborhood? So Steve, when you, like, kind of just going on, because as I have something that I always say, is just like, you know, we, re we need to start young when it comes to certain things because you're still developing and you're mm -hmm. still really understanding things. So I'm like, if we were to um, have adults or just have others who really educated us, like you, educating at a young age, do you think about unity and embracing each other's differences and the oneness of the human family? I mean, do you think that that would aid in having a more a more unified world and a more peaceful world? It, I was just down in Columbia and, and one of the things we sponsor down there for the high schools and most of the kids in the schools are actually not Baha'i. There, a lot of them are Catholic since Columbia is a very Catholic country. And it's just wonderful. They're reading from the Baha'i writings and all the things you just mentioned, they're being taught from a very young age. And it makes such a huge difference. There's a waiting list to get into these schools. They're academically, just in, in standard academics, very high standards but they're also being taught these spiritual lessons of love and unity and compassion and mercy and truth and justice at a very young age. And I think that's imperative 
Now you think about bullying, bullying wouldn't happen. Anyone who'd been taught those things I just mentioned, those spiritual virtues, couldn't be a bully. They would see your humanity. The bullies, you know, I know it was very painful for you, but ultimately what I've said to you, and I know I've said this to you before, the issue is not with you, it's with the bullies. You, you know, you know, I love you. I think you're a great kid. I, I from the day I met you, I, I see who you are and I see your heart and I love your heart. You know, in the Baha'i faith, you look at a person, the color of a person's heart, not their skin. And I see your beautiful heart. And I've told you that before. And the, the bullies are blind. You know, so I feel like I feel sorry for them as blind people that they couldn't see this and that they were spiritually handicapped. I know that that's probably, you know, probably the best way I would describe it is they're handicapped spiritually. They might have been, you know, physically able, but they're handicapped from a spiritual perspective. And that's really a terrible way to go around life. That's why I said I feel sorry for the person that bullied me. And I hope that he's healed from the pain he must have been going through to be such a hater because it's, it's not a pleasant thing. And that's one of the reasons we need to forgive so we can take the hatred out of our own hearts so it doesn't hurt us. You don't yeah. deserve that. You deserve better. You're a good kid. You don't deserve that pain of hating. Yeah, no one deserves that pain of hating. Thank you for sharing that. And so Steve, I remember when we went to the Baha'i Temple and there's actually multiple Baha'i Temples, but we went to the one in um, Chicago, which was just, gorgeous i loved my whole time being there and i know you always give people tours and really explain the history like how you did for me and my family and the humanity rising team so why don't you tell us why it's important for you to be at that temple well for me spiritual education is the most important thing and i believe that all of humanity is in this baha'i era that every messenger of god oh, they basically inaugurate a new era for their for the age. So Jesus inaugurated a beautiful Christian age, which was which led to a golden age for Christianity. Uh, Muhammad inaugurated a great golden age for Islam. It was called literally the golden age of Islam and lasted 500 years after every messenger. Moses inaugurated a great golden age for Judaism and, and Buddha for Buddhism and Krishna for Hinduism back 5,000 years ago. Today, that golden age is from Baha'u'llah. And we get so uh, protective uh, and uh, we get so attached to our messenger. I have a lot of Christians, you know, I'm actually having a conversation with a Christian right now on Facebook who's very attached to Jesus is the only way. And, and I'm being kind about it. I disagree. Um, I do agree that Jesus is the only way, as, as you know, you, you and I have talked about it. But Krishna said he was the way. Buddha said he was the way. Uh, Moses probably said it as well, although I don't think we have it down. Muhammad said he was the way. He called it the straight path. The Bab said he was the way. And Baha'u'llah said they were all the way. Each one of them is the way in, in each time. And so when we, when we detach from, I love this messenger, but not that one, and we start looking at the teachings of the messengers, we see that they're virtually the same century after century when they come every 500 to 1,000 years. And the difference is only the social laws and teachings. It's very important for the world to embrace the social laws and teachings of Baha'u'llah, which I'll, I'll just list them, a few of them. Equality of men and women. You already talked about the elimination of all types of prejudice. Um, the idea that science and religion must be in harmony, universal education. Um, so these are some of the things we need to embrace, essentially that we're one human family and the nobility of every human being. That's really important. Again, bullying would go away if we viewed each other as noble. And there will be a future society where people are taught these things at an early age. And when that happens, we'll heal. You know, if you can look at where society is today, you know, look at the last couple of years, how, how are things going out there? <laughs> Interesting to bring that up. <laughs> I get what you're trying to go with that. So we, we need these lessons. And so I'm at the Baha'i Temple really trying, because I think, and this is very important, and I'll say this, you have to go to the heart in order to affect change. I can't go to someone who's in the KKK or a white supremacist, or even someone who's, who, there are black people who hate white people. I can't, I can't go to that person who hates me or you and say, here's the logical reason not to hate. I have to go to their heart first, and I have to change their heart. Otherwise, it's ineffective. And again, that's something I know through the Baha'i faith as well. Wow, Steve, I really like how you um, 
actually, I just kind of like how you worded everything that you said, because it just kind of brings up a bunch of different um, like points for me. But one of the um, one thing that it also brings up for me is the fact that like when I when I look at students at school and they're, um, you know, there's like a presentation that some like adult comes in, like way older adult comes in and they're like speaking and then all the students don't really listen just because of the fact that they're like, oh, it's basically another teacher coming in. All right, let me go to sleep. They tune out, they don't do any of that. But what I noticed when like, when someone their age comes in, they're more likely to listen because it's someone who they can relate to on a deeper level. And it's someone who can like appeal to their heart and like have that avenue to really come through and give you this understanding, whether it's talking about the Baha'i faith or unity, which directly, uh, directly relates back to the Baha'i faith or bullying, like with me, when it comes to bullying, I remember when I spoke um, to, or one of the times where I spoke at this fifth grade um, class and um, I talk, talked about the different types of bullying, social, physical, verbal, um, and cyber. And man, that, that opened up, like all these young, these children were telling me about all their bullying experiences. And then it was just like, their parents didn't really like, I mean, excuse me, the school didn't really do anything. And they were really just kind of, the parents had them taken out and then brought into another school. And so have you ever had, have you ever had experiences where you've opened up people's hearts to the point where now they're just really telling you a lot about the pain that they've gone through, about the trauma that they've gone through? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing I should say is my mother is a psychologist. And so I think that, that that's an interesting thing, too, that, that uh, I don't know if you knew that. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm kind of used to that. And I learned it. I learned it from my mother that uh, I, I learned to to get people to open up. I think it's natural for me. And so, yes. I, I do have that happen. It happens to me pretty regularly, actually, that people open up to me. So, um, Steve, I know you have like had a, an amazing journey just through the Baha'i faith and through all of your work really spreading the message of unity. Um, what's been the greatest experience you've ever had as a Baha'i? Oh, wow. <laughs> the greatest experience I've ever had was actually before I became a Baha'i. And that was, uh, I, I was, so my, I have to explain this. I decided to become a Baha'i in October of 2013. And I went to my wife and I was very excited. I said, I'm a Baha'i now. And she said, no, you're not. You have to wait until after the children's bar mitzvah. And I, that was two and a half years away. So I sat down to wait to become a Baha'i. And I was ready to do that. And then fate intervened. And I'm going to actually change the picture behind me. This is the um, picture of the, the garden surrounding the shrine of Baha'u'llah, which is the holiest place in the Baha'i faith. And uh, actually, within a couple months of this happening, uh, within six months, my company went public. And right at that same time, I called up, to, I called up a man by the name of Bill Strickland, who is uh, African-American in Pittsburgh and does these wonderful centers. And, and we become like brothers. We are brothers, brothers from another mother. And I, I love Bill. We've built two centers together. I told him I wanted to build a center in Chicago. And we started building this center in Chicago. And uh, it's after school uh, arts for kids and it's vocational for adults. And I, um, about five conversations into this, Bill says to me, I'm talking to these Jewish philanthropists about building a center in Akko, Israel. Well, this shrine of Baha'u'llah, it's in Akko, Israel. Every day, including today, I turn towards Akko and I pray. Uh, every, everybody in the world prays towards Akko. It's the holiest place. It's our Mecca. And if we can, we make a pilgrimage to Akko, which again, I also have done. But I wasn't yet a Baha'i. So I was praying to Akko because I wanted to become a Baha'i, but I hadn't yet ever visited Akko or made a pilgrimage there. And here was Bill, who wasn't a Baha'i, asking me to go and build a center there which, I mean, Akko is not even that big a city. So I went to Akko. We ended up building the center. It's called ACAD. It's doing great work, making peace between Arabs and Jews, speaking of unifying people. And I walked into this garden that you see behind me. And I had a complete um, spiritual transformation. I started crying. 
I saw that we were in a new age and that Baha'u'llah had, was really the, the complete author of that new age. I had this like vision, and not quite a vision, but I just knew it. And I've never changed my mind that this is Baha'u'llah's age and that world peace is coming in this age. And then I had to tell people about it. And so I immediately left that garden. And that's all I would do was tell people about the Bible. My wife literally thought I'd gone crazy, but I was so excited about this. I mean, imagine, you know, you know, Christians around the world are all waiting for Christ to return. And I knew that he had, and, and that his name was Baha'u'llah. The Bible actually says that I will come in the glory of my father. And that's actually the translation of Baha'u'llah, glory, the glory of God. So I will literally come as Baha'u'llah, the Bible's telling you. But Christians have missed this. And, and so it's, I think it's super exciting that Christ has returned. Um, you know, Muslims and Christians are waiting for Christ to return. The Jews are waiting for the Messiah. He's the promised one of all faiths. And he's come with world peace. I mean, that's exciting news. I'm still excited saying it. And why not? How badly does the world need peace? Steve, thank you for sharing that. That's very insightful. That's very, um, I keep on saying interesting, but like, it's really, I'm so glad you shared that with me because now that makes me want to go to that garden just to get that like spirit, almost like spiritual awakening. I'm really, now I'm really interested in that. So everyone watching, you need to look into that too if you haven't, or also let us know if you have and tell us your experience there. But um, that's really, or you want to say something? Yeah, I, I know we're running out of time. I wanted to say one thing. I spoke to a class, you know, speaking of old people, speaking to young people, I spoke to a class of, of young people last week, and I wanted to impart on you kind of what I imparted them, because I always make sure I say this whenever I talk to young people, and that is um, to make sure you get your spiritual nourishment today. You've heard me say this before, and that's a really big thing, and it's interesting because I asked everyone in the class, and only one person had done, they all believed they had a soul. But no one, not one person in the class had done one thing that day to feed their soul. And I think that's a huge crisis. And it's very common if I went to high school classes all over the country. And I always say this, you wouldn't forget to eat. Don't forget to feed your soul spiritually. Pray, meditate, serve humanity, read God's word. Do something to feed your soul every day and you'll be much happier. And I know there's kind of a crisis right now with uh, adolescents, uh, with teenagers being unhappy depression and anxiety, suicide, drugs. I really think this would be very helpful to know. And just think of it that way. Like, just think of it. I eat every day. I wouldn't not eat. And, and we are primarily spiritual beings. So do something every day to feed your soul. Steve, I want to thank you for joining me today and leaving us off with that great advice. So thank you again for joining me. Thank you again for joining us and really sharing your journey. It's always great to talk to you. We need to talk more often. I'm sorry we haven't talked to you. I, know busy. I have to come visit you in Maryland because I actually support the Baha'i Chair for World Peace there. So I could go visit you and her at the same time. Oh, yeah. Awesome. You definitely, definitely come on down uh, or over. I know that I'm going to really be work, um, speaking more to Dr. Mamoudi too. Because um, mm -hmm. I really want to get like integrated when it comes to the Baha'i faith. I really want to embrace that, especially when I'm you know, in college and can kind of just like fully find a bunch of different things. So that also is why I can't wait for college too. Well, I think she, I, I think she's great to talk to, you know, more importantly, just enjoy your journey wherever it leads you. And I'm happy that you've been inspired like me by the Baha'i faith. But most importantly, I just want you to keep doing what you're doing. Keep standing up and, and, and not only stand up, I'm going to say to everybody, everybody needs to do it with what you've done, what Devin has done which is stand up, not just for yourself, but for others. When you see someone being bullied, stand up for them. When you see someone being oppressed, and most importantly, when that person doesn't has something different than you. So people who have my skin color, white, stand up for someone who's black. Someone who's black, stand up for someone who's white. Stand up for someone from a different religion, a different country. Because when we stand up for each other, not just the people who are in our family, not just maybe my brother, my actual physical brother or sister, but when we look at all of humanity as our brothers and sisters, then we have unity, and then we, we have peace. We need to stand up for someone who's not exactly like us. Steve, thank you again. This has truly been a great time. And we, yeah, we do need to keep, uh, catch up more and more often too, because I'm just so like, just 
all of my time knowing you, it's really just been amazing because of the fact that I've learned so much from you. I truly do admire you too. Just um, if you haven't already known that. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. Um, oh, wait, do you um, have any social media or maybe your website that you'd like to share so people know how to find you? Well, um, Wayfair, uh, you can look up Wayfair Studios. That's our movie company and, and check out our movies, especially Empire Waste that's going to be coming out. I know kids will really like that movie and maybe Racist Trees as well. Um, we have a movie, actually, I'm wearing the shirt right now, which is <laughs> Movie Clouds, which is on Disney+. Plus. And then uh, my film, The Gate, if you're interested more in the Baha'i Faith, you, uh, my film, The Gate, Dawn of the Baha'i Faith, is available for free on YouTube. And it was named the uh, 2008 Religious Documentary of the Year. So there's a few websites. And you can find me on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you to everyone who's watching. I hope you all join us at Future Race to Speak Up podcast. If you have any questions about the Race to Speak Up podcast, feel free to contact me at race to speak up at gmail.com. Make sure to follow at race to speak up on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for updates on future podcasts and join the Humanity Rising movement. Humanity Rising is a student-led movement to create a better world through service and offers scholarships for students making a difference in the world. Visit www.humanityrising.org for more information. And before we wrap up this episode of the Race to Speak Up podcast, I want to make sure that you guys go to my website, racetospeakup.com slash shop and pre-order my first children's anti-bullying book, Devin Speaks Up. It will be released in October for National Bullying Prevention Month. Thanks, guys. Um, and remember to ask yourself this question. How do you race to speak up? <laughs>